as part of my teaching on the Song of Songs, I looked at the aspects a few weeks ago of forgiveness and how forgiveness is such an important principle in our faith. Uh, forgiveness that we receive from uh, the Lord in terms of our sin, when we come to repent and say sorry, he forgives us freely and willingly. And I looked also at the aspect of forgiveness between each other as believers and, and forgiving non-believers as well. And uh, I, I examined the words of Yeshua in Matthew 18, which speaks uh, very clearly about forgiveness and what God expects of us and what Yeshua actually expects of each other, uh, of us as a, as a believing community. At the same time, I'm looking at, at, at Holocaust again because we're preparing for our memorial service on the 26th of uh, January. Holocaust Memorial is actually the 27th of January, but we have it, our uh, memorial service on a Sunday so that we can host our assembly members and our members of parliament who would be in parliament uh, on a Monday and can't make it on a Monday. So, so I'm preparing all that and as part of that preparation I'm reading or have read the book called The Sunflower which was written by Simon Weisenthal who uh, is a Holocaust survivor. And it's such an important book in respect of forgiveness that what I wanted to do was to read each section of the book on a, my podcast on a Friday so that you could all uh, think about what forgiveness is about and how pe different people deal with it. Now this book is written in such a way that, that Simon writes about his experience and then he has experts in both the Jewish and the Christian community make comments in the book about their thoughts on forgiveness. And um, I, it's very, very interesting and very, very challenging. And um, I want to do that just to spend 10 minutes each Friday going through Simon's story before we look at the uh, opinions of others. So I hope you enjoy this. It, 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 if you let me know how it works as well for you. But I'm, I'll just read the um, the. the introduction to this book and as i say it's called the sunflower it's taught in schools in america as well just for you to know uh, so that the, the americans can look american children can look at the aspect of uh, forgiveness but this is the introduction whilst in prison in a nazi concentration camp simon weissenthal was taken one day from his work detail to the bedside of a dying member of the ss Haunted by the crimes in which he had participated, the soldier wanted to confess to and obtain absolution from a Jew. Faced with the choice between compassion and justice, silence and truth, Weisenthal said nothing. But even after years after the war had ended, Simon wondered, had he done the right thing? What would you have done if you'd have been in Simon's place? In this important book, 53 distinguished men and women respond to Simon Weissenthal's questions. They are theologians, political leaders, writers, jurists, psychiatrists, human rights activists, Holocaust survivors, and victims of attempted genocide in Bosnia, Cambodia, China, and Tibet. Their response, as varied as their experiences are of the world, remind us that Simon's questions are not limited to events of the past, often surprising and always thought-provoking. The sunflower will challenge us all to define our beliefs about justice, compassion and human responsibility. And I'm going to add into this the responsibility of all Christians to forgive. Simon Weissenthal has been honoured internationally for his work in identifying Nazi war criminals. The author of many books, including The Murders Amongst Us and Justice Not Vengeance, he lives today, uh, he, well actually he's, he's not alive, he's dead now, but he did live in Austria and, uh, and produced this wonderful book, 
which is a challenge to us as we uh, examine what it was like for him to be uh, spoken to by a Nazi officer in such a way that this Nazi officer was asking him to forgive on behalf of the Jewish people. So let's start the chapters uh, that Simon uh, wrote. So chapter one. What was it, Arthur said last night? I tried hard to remember. I knew it was very important. If only I were not so tired. I was standing on the parade ground where the prisoners were slowly assembling. They had just had their breakfast. A dark, bitter brew which the camp cooks had the nerve to call coffee. The men were still swallowing the stuff as they mustered for the roll call, anxious not to be late. I had not fetched my coffee as I did not want to force my way through the crowd. The space in front of the kitchen was a favourite hunting ground for the many sadists amongst the SS. They usually hid behind the huts and whenever they felt like it, they swooped like birds of prey onto the helpless prisoners. Every day some were injured. It was part of the programme. As we stood silent and gloomy, waiting for the order to fall in, my thoughts were not concerned with the dangers which always lurked on such occasions, but were entirely centred on last night's talk. Yes, I remembered. It was last night. We lay in the dark. There were low groans, soft whispering and occasional ghostly creaks as someone moved on his plank bed. One could hardly discern faces, but could easily identify a speaker by his voice. During the day, two of the men from our hut had actually been in the ghetto. The guard officer had given them his permission. An irrational whim, perhaps inspired by some bribe, I don't know. The likelihood was that this was a mere whim for what did a prisoner possess to bribe an officer with? And now the men were making their report. Arthur huddled up close to them, so as not to miss a word. They brought news from outside, war news. I listened, half asleep. The people in the ghetto had plenty of information, and we in the camp had only a small share of their knowledge. We had to piece bits together from the scanty reports of those who worked outside during the day and overheard what the Poles and Ukrainians were talking about, facts and rumours. Sometimes even people in the street whispered a piece of news to them from sympathy or consolation. Seldom was the news good. And when it was one question, if it was really true or merely wishful thinking, Bad news, on the other hand, we accepted unquestionably. We were used to that. And one piece of bad news followed another, each more alarming than the last. Today's news was worse than yesterday's, and tomorrow's would be worse still. The stuffy atmosphere in the hut seemed to stifle thought. As week after week we slept, huddled together in the same sweat-sodden clothes that we wore at work during the day. Many of us were so exhausted, we did not even take our boots off. From time to time, the night, in the night, a man would scream in his sleep, a nightmare perhaps, or his neighbour may have kicked him. The hut had once been a stable, and the half-open skylight did not admit enough air to provide oxygen for the 150 men who lay penned together in the tiers of bunks. In the polyglot mass of humanity were members of various social strata, rich, poor, highly educated and illiterate, religious men and agnostics, the kind-hearted and the selfish, courageous men and dull-witted. A common fate had made them all equal, but inevitably they splintered into small groups, close communities of men who in other circumstances would never be found together. The group to which I belonged included my old friend Arthur and a Jew named Joseph, a recent arrival. These were my closest companions. Joseph 
was sensitive and deeply religious. His faith could hurt, would be hurt by the environment of the camp and by the jeers of insinuations of others. But it could never be shaken. I, for one, could only envy him. He had an answer for everything, while we others vainly groped for explanations and felt victims to despair. His peace of mind sometimes disconcerted us, Arthur especially, whose attitude to life was ironic, was irritated by Joseph's placidity, and sometimes he even mocked him or was angry with him. Jokingly, I called Joseph rabbi. He was not, of course, a rabbi. He was a businessman, but religion permeated his life. He knew that he was superior to us, that we were the poorer for our lack of faith, but he was ever ready to share his wealth of wisdom and piety with us and give us strength. But what consolation was it to know that we were not the first Jews to be persecuted? And what comfort was it when Joseph, rummaging amongst his inexhaustible treasure of antidotes and legends, proved to us that suffering is the companion of every man from birth onwards. As soon as Joseph spoke, he forgot or ignored his surroundings completely. We had the feeling that he was simply unaware of his position. On one occasion, we nearly quarreled on this point. It was Sunday evening. We had stopped work at midday and lay in our bunks relaxing. Someone was talking about the news. It was, of course, sad as usual. Joseph seemed not to be listening. He asked no questions as others were doing, but suddenly he sat up and his face looked radiant. He then began to speak. He said, Our scholars say that at the creation of man, four angels stood as godparents. The angels of mercy, truth, peace and justice. For a long time they disputed as to whether God ought to create man at all. The strongest opponent was the angel of truth. This angel God, uh, this angered God, and as a punishment he sent him into banishment on earth. But the other angels begged God to pardon him, and finally he listened to them and summoned the angel of truth back to heaven. The angel brought back a clod of earth, which was soaked in his tears, tears that he had shed on being banished from heaven. And from this clod of earth, the Lord created man. Arthur the cynic was vexed and interrupted Jack Joseph's discourse. Joseph, he said, I'm prepared to believe that God created a Jew out of this teared, soaked clod of earth. But do you expect me to believe he also made our camp commandment, commandant? Wilhouse out of the same material? You are forgetting Cain, replied Joseph. And you are forgetting where you are. Cain slew Abel in anger, but he never tortured him. Cain had a personal attachment to his brother, but we are strangers to our murderers. I, was, I saw at once that Joseph was deeply hurt, and to prevent a quarrel, I joined in the conversation. Arthur, I said, you are forgetting the thousands of years of evolution that is known as progress. But both of them merely laughed bitterly in times like the, these, such platitudes were meaningless. Arthur's question wasn't altogether justified. We were truly all made of the same stuff. If so, why were murderers, why were some murderers and others victims? Was there in fact a personal relationship between us, between the murderers and the victims, between our camp commandment, com commandant, Wilhouse, and a tortured Jew? And last night I was lying in my bunk, half asleep. My back hurt, I felt dizzy. I listened to the voices which seemed to come from far away. I heard something about a piece of news from the BBC in London or from Radio Mo Moscow. Suddenly, Arthur gripped my shoulder and shook me. Simon, do you hear? He cried. Yes, I murmured. I hear. I hope you're listening with your ears, for your eyes are half closed and you really must hear what the old woman said 
Which old woman, I asked. I thought you were talking about what you heard on the BBC. That was earlier. You must have dozed off. The old woman was saying, what could she have said? Does she know when we will get out of here or when they are going to slaughter us? Nobody knows the answer to the, those questions. So I'll carry on reading next week. Shabbat Shalom, Mike Fryer.